for aspiring artists should be aware of the multiplicity of ways. Everything that is perfect or that tries to be perfect um, tends to be repeatable, coming out with a better understanding of what musical imperfection can be. Research in the art. And that's exactly stressing this place of the composer as like the, the person who really counts. Then the performer has to disappear and be, in a negative sense, an imperfect executor. No, this is exactly what is mm -hmm. written. Just play what is written. Being able to do very well. <laughs> I am actually mm -hmm. very critical of the idea of trend in new music. You don't always know where you are because you're creating your own path. I am a mess. Oh, wow. Hi, Marzi folks. This is Elena, and today I have a very special guest for this interview. This is Marcio Stoenagel with me, who is a composer, a conductor. He is an artistic researcher pursuing his doctoral degree at the University of Music and Performing Arts in Graz, in Austria. Marcio is a conductor of the Philharmonic Orchestra of the Federal University of Paraná, Brazil, a professor at the School of Music of the State University of Paraná, Brazil, and the founding member of the Ensemble Entre Compositores. Hi, Marcio, and welcome. Hi, Lina. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor for me. Uh, we are going to discuss modern tendencies in the world of composition, contemporary composition today. The important subject of imperfection, what does it mean to actually be perfect as a performing artist, as a composer, and what does imperfection mean in our lives and in the art, in the modern art of the world today in 2021. So Marcia, the first question, what is it like in the post-lockdown world for you as an artist, as a composer, what are the new tendencies generally? What do you see the world like today? Mm. Well, starting with the lockdown, as in many other fields, I think one thing that happened is that technologies and tendencies that were already there, but were, let's say, slowly progressing or slowly changing, suddenly changed all of a sudden. So things that we thought would be 10 years in, in maturing were suddenly put in place in a few months. And regarding composition and regarding art in specific, um, the, the possibility of, of course, of long distance co-production, artistic production was really intensified. Um, so I remember, for instance, a colleague from Brazil who almost 10 years ago or perhaps seven years ago, he started to study the possibility of composing operas for Skype. It was Skype at mm -hmm. the time. And it was like, okay, guy, you're, you're crazy. It's like, on no delay. How does that work? And, and of course, then the necessity of composing open forms and composing the delay into to the structures. And suddenly, I mean, when the lockdown started, this was very necessary. So, of course, um, let's say the, the range starts with a, a Zoom call. And right. then, but then when you have to do a Zoom rehearsal with a performance that's in another place, you already have all the technical issues with, with canceling and the phases and everything. But um, it extends further. So, for instance, I was... I was in a festival in Livorno, I was, I was in Graz, mm -hmm. but um, one of the things of the festival was that most of the composers, not my piece, but most of the composers, they were working with real-time electronics from another place. Okay. So the performers were, they actually were recorded in Livorno, and in the moment of streaming, there was a second system in which another composer in New York or whatever would modify the, the in real time the composition. Uh -huh. using a, a program specially developed for that. So, of course, this impacts, for instance, you can't think of precision mm. in this sense. Absolutely, yeah. So, and the music tended to be more, let's say, layered and spread out, if you uh -huh. think like of, of a water painting rather than a pencil etching. Um, that had an, a, a very strong aesthetic impact due to technology that was suddenly put forward because of a necessity of, of Corona. So I think that's a good example of what's been happening in this specific regard. So there is this unpredictable aspect all the time because of the conditions we are forced to live in. 
Yes. That adds to the art. Yes, it's important to, for me to, to, to stress that that's... To speak of that as completely different is to stress an underlying assumption that um, in, in, in person music making, we are always completely precise and together. And I mean, of course, that is a desire of much of the performance practice, but it, it's not always the case. And for, for instance, if you think of, of Monteverdi, Cores Pesati, um, the, the very fact that in, in many of, of Monteverdi's works, you have the same thing, let's say, for, for two tenors, but one of them is in the back of the church, mm -hmm. already works with this idea of the dislocation of sound and the, let's say, the blurring given by the delay of the church. Mm -hmm. So in a certain sense, it's not so different. The, the aesthetical result, the thing you have to resort to to make it work is the same, is working not with, with precise alignments, but with blurred relationships, diagonal relationships, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's not, and of course the technologies are new, but it's, it's rather a contribution to a multiple way of doing things than a fundamental change to, let's say, one single way of doing things. It's multiplication. Yeah. Do you think that now this might become one of the main tendencies? This is where the world is going to shift? Or do you think that the precision will still mm. have a very strong place in the art? It's... My, I, I had a, a, a former professor of musical historiography, and he used to say that things don't disappear. They just go to the margins. <laughs> so I, I say that because I think it's a, it's a mistake to think that this is the new rule mm -hmm. in the sense that this will not make concerts disappear. And there, are, there are some special things that can only happen in person. And there's a specific value, an, an aura, if you will, to, to, to being with, with people, with real people. And I think if, if, if something has changed, is that we value this more at least personally. But of course, this open, uh, there's no way back. Mm -hmm. So talking about conferences, for instance, um, if on one hand, there, there is this sense of loss because a great part of a conference is meeting people and right. you know, really discussing your topics at the coffee break. And there, there are many attempts of filling this gap in online conferences, mm -hmm. but it never, it's not the same it's thing. Not the same, yes. On the other hand, um, suddenly there are people participating from, you know, a lot of more people from Australia and New Zealand and, and there is an enrichment because of the possibilities, which also has, of course, um, political connotations because it suddenly becomes more democratic, mm -hmm. of course, to a certain extent, because it's only democratic for people who have a computer and a good right. connection. But still, more people have a computer and a good connection than can afford, let's say, a, a flight to Europe from New Zealand. So um, some things... My, my feeling is that we want to go back because we value them too much, but some things we want to keep. So I think two things will happen. Uh, one is a multiplication of possibilities. So you have choice A and B. Mm -hmm. And a second is a partial superposition of possibilities. So to stay in the, in the field of the concert, I, uh, of the, sorry, of the conferences, I think one thing that might happen is that you have a presential conference but it's a small, it's a smaller amount of people that come and are like a, and make a core, and then there's an extension to many people who can participate from afar and perhaps with, with streaming or with lectures available for for eight hours. Mm -hmm. So there will be like a hybrid setting mm -hmm. most of the time. Yeah, probably. I guess so. I guess yeah, so. I was thinking about this entire trend of perfection and. It was so important to, you know, have a perfect recording, perfect performance, not to miss a note and all, all these things. Do you think the world is a bit fed up with this perfection trend mm -hmm. that everything looks too, you know, too good? Like, I don't know, starting from filters and Instagram and, and finishing up with the recordings that are cut and uh, created in a way that everything seems to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's too much of this and now the world actually values imperfection perhaps more, perhaps it's more of an acceptance trend? I actually think so. I think it's kind of, it's risky to talk about trends and I'll, I'll go back to that later. But 
I actually can see that happening. Um, of course, as, as I was saying before, um, I don't think Instagram filters are going away. <laughs> yeah, that's just a blunt example. Yeah. But, 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 but we still I, I mean, there. There, there is yeah. this, there will, I, um, this, this approach to the world and where everything is controlled and, yeah. and cleaned up. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. think that's, that, that's disappearing, but I think other spaces are opening up mm -hmm. and, uh, a good example for me is always when, when things start to pop up in more popular um, contexts, mm -hmm. so to speak. So, for instance, I mean, there, there's a lot of discussion already in many things that are related to, to imperfection in the media. For instance, there's this text from Legion Lona from, from 84 or 83, um, The Error as Necessity. And, and, and Legion Lona, this Italian composer, he already works with this a lot. But then you, you listen, let's say, to the latest two albums, like from Bon Iver, like a really pop band, and then finally glitch there. Mm -hmm. And when, when you see that in a, in a very, a band that was indie and has become very popular, it's, it's a sign that um, this aesthetic trait is kind of not spread in the, in the sense of hegemonical, but um, it's, it's inseminating. It's inseminating a, a wider comprehension of, of the world. And in that aspect, yes, I think um, there is more opening for an... And I think you're totally right to say that's a kind of sense of being fed up. Because everything that is perfect, or that tries to be perfect, um, tends to be repeatable. Mm -hmm. So we have a sense of sameness. Whereas only the imperfect is unique. And I think we, we, we lack that uniqueness. I mean, we, we miss it. After, after, after a certain time of sameness, when something different happens, it kind of, as a, a former professor would say, it scratches the, the perfectly polished surface uh -huh. of time. You know. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so my next question is about the topic of imperfection that is really your dissertation topic, mm -hmm. the subject of your doctoral work, and why is it this topic? I mean, I'm not the first person to ask this, so I'm sure that you have formulated a way to actually explain it hopefully. <laughs> right now. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully before I end, I will yeah. have a clear way to explain it. Uh, yes, this, this topic actually came um, from already from my artistic creation. So... Um, when I was working towards my doctoral degree, I looked at my production and I, and I saw it was already an interest in a very unconscious way. And then of course, this required me to formulate it in a, in a clearer sense. And in doing so, I noticed that this has been a hot topic for a few years, but always in a very dispersed way or related to a specific um, context. And I'll get back to that in, in a moment. And formulating this, I've, I've discovered that it's actually relevant to more people. So um, there is a specific need for this topic right now. So what I am doing is I am looking at imperfection in music as a fundamental um, compositional and performative dimension. Um, when I mean fundamental, uh, I mean the fact that it exists, that it's always there. But um, I am tending to change it or perhaps shift from a, a contingential understanding to a positive dimension. Mm -hmm. That means just to say, okay, we know that it exists towards, we accept that it exists and how can we explore this in aesthetically significant ways? Um, of course, the first problem is that imperfection is a very elusive word. It's one of those words that perfection and imperfection that when we don't try to define them, we use them as if we knew what they mean. And as soon as we try to define them, they escape. <laughs> So um, the, first, um, the first step is understanding this shift, not, not fixing one meaning, but understanding the many meanings. Um, and secondly, um, it's, it's an artistic research, so it's very much anchored in musical practice. And in musical practice, there are actually senses of perfection that are very strong and operating very strongly. So to identify these, and then from these, identify an opposing imperfection as a place to explore is a, is a second step. So of course I could, I could list a few of them. There's a place of the score, a place of the composer, 
um, technical control. So there are quite a, a few. And in these, of course, then I go deeper, mainly through composition of seeing what can be positively gained from exploring the possibility of imperfection. And in doing so, understanding the topic in itself. That means not only creating more music, but coming out with a better understanding of what musical imperfection can be. Research in the art. The aspect of performers being co-creators for you as a composer. So how, how much do you regard your performers that they are actually co-composers or you give very particular directions. So what's, what's your process of working mm -hmm. with people who perform your music? This, to answer this question, I think we first have to look at the significance of the question. And what I'm saying is that it's important to say there are hierarchical values charged into this question. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to discern what is regarded as creation and what is regarded as interpretation or execution. So there are these divides, which are, of course, mostly artificial, or if not artificial, at least, um, you have to choose where you put the divide. Where, mm -hmm. where, what, what is perform, what is interpretation, what is execution, and those things get blurred. Oh yes. All, all the same at the same time. So um, it, there's a there's a great risk to simply answer the question as like branding value mm -hmm. on the performance. Say no, um, the performer is actually a co-creator, a co-composer, but we're not really advancing any deeper understanding of what that means. We're just um, kind of. Uh, I, we have the risk of patting the performer on the back and saying, you are as important as a composer. And that's is actually stressing this place of the composer as like the, the person who really counts. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we, I think we actually have to understand this continuum better and, and the, the ways in which it can be more oriented towards one performance practice, more oriented towards other performance practice. Having said that, I can say that I have no intention um, of stressing a specific understanding of the role of performer that was very strong in the 20th century. That is this thing of the performer as a simple executor. So this is a discourse that has a history, uh, has a genealogy. Um, you, you, can, you can trace it down during the 20th century um, in the way Schoenberg talked, in the way Stravinsky talked, in, in the way Boulez talked, and it's a discourse. It, I mean, it's there's there's a politics <laughs> that 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 have the interest of putting that in place, an understanding of what music is, which is actually a modernist understanding in the sense that it is hyper romantic, that you know you understand the work of as something almost with a platonic existence, mm -hmm. and then of course if the the value is on the work whatever that is, then the performer has to disappear, and be in a negative sense an imperfect executor to try to convey this meaning mm -hmm. that is somewhere else to the audience so it can be listened to. So you see, even, I mean, you see Adorno talking about music in, in those senses. And in this sense, imperfection can only be negative. I mean, you, okay, you accept it because it is the price to pay for you to be able to access this work of art that is somewhere else. But that, that has changed a lot. Um, it was not, even in the 20th century, it was not the only possibility, never was. And of course, even before that, there are many other relationships. Um, the specialization of the role of the composer uh, only happens very gradually um, and only matures in the beginning of the 19th century, really. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it happens during the 18th century, so to speak. But before that, in the 16th century, most, most composers executed their own pieces and mm -hmm. And there are, I mean, even for Handel, you have composers saying, well, you know, the, the, the singer can improvise this idea because you know, this one I don't have to compose, he or she can mm -hmm. improvise it. It already has a text. So these things are already blurred before and later. Um, now coming to, to, my, to my composition and what I'm, I'm working with. I think there is much to be gained in understanding the score not as one point that therefore has infinite dimensions, uh, infinitely small dimensions, that has to be approached as closely as possible. So then the score embodies an idea, which is the work, and it must be approached in the best possible way. 
I think it's much more inter interesting if we understand um, the score in this play in this in this case, and that can be more specific or less specific, as something that creates, mm -hmm. in the sense that many um, different musics emerge from this. Um, and then the discussion of what is the work, if it is the score, if it is the performances, um, is, is a very interest, interesting question, philosophically speaking. But still, there is a difference between approaching the score as and telling the performer, no, this is exactly what is written, just play what is written. And even to be able to answer, which would be a crime many years ago for me, if the performer asks, well, what exactly should sound here? And you can say, I don't really know. This is a completely different approach, which is a, does not mean that you're not responsible towards your composition because you can know where you started, where you ended. You can know what are the general field of possibilities. Like I know that in general, this has this color or this works like this in the music, but I don't know exactly what will sound here. Hmm. And that's a big change. That's a big change. And of course that requires a change in the performer's attitude. Um, as you will certainly know that conflicts directly with many values that are put in place. Um, and of course, their performance will say, no, that's your job. You have to tell me exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. And then I'm less interested. And there are performers who will say, well, I'm actually happy that I can relate to this and bring my own experience and bring also my own research in the sense that I also don't know. Right. And then something different happens um, because the, the discussion of imperfection is very mature in two fields. In the field of technology, in which we discuss glitch, and um, it's, it's actually a comprehension of the mediality of technology in the sense that it's not perfectly working and transparent, but that things happen in media. So it's, it's not, yeah, it's actually more imperfect than we tend to think of it as. That's one field. Um, the other one is on improvisation. Mm -hmm. So especially by Andy Hamilton, that's a professor of philosophy in Durham. And he has this text from 2000, if I'm not mistaken, which is, um, uh, improvisation, the art of imperfection. And he has, uh, he has these seminars on imperfection music re related to improvisation. Um, but the thing is, of course, improvisation and performance are what he calls interpenetrating opposites. Op uh, opposites. So you, you can talk in, uh, of the directions in which they come, but of course they're always mixed to some extent. Um, but somehow when you work with improvisation, more open or less open, um, you find things that you can never repeat and which are unique. So it, it is frequently sonically very rich. But of course, there is a price to pay. And sometimes I think that is in the in terms of long term planning and complexity, mm -hmm. in a sense that um, it's hard to improvise a six part fugue. You know, because and I say six part because four part, you can if, do it alone. If not impossible at all. Probably if yeah, because someone it, can do it. it. But it would, it would, I mean, okay, then an eight part, then a 12 part, you know, because at some point you, you need a shared, you would need a shared consciousness mm -hmm. of each performer, knowing that the other will play this note so I can play that other note. Right. So that's a possibility that, that's only given in planning a notation. And you see that when notation starts to mature in the history of music, you get longer spans. I mean, to, to plan a crescendo that will happen in, you know, 12 minutes and it will happen in different parameters so you can sustain the interest, um, that, that's hard to do without planning. So these are, these are kind of the prices you pay in improvisation mm -hmm. for a specific understanding of imperfection in the sense that it's not related to a perfect score or a perfect planned plan. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, this 20th century performance practice will tell you, okay, I have the plan, now just execute it. Then you, you compromise the possibility of unique things happening. You have to, for instance, use a technique that you can repeat every time mm -hmm. and you can control because or else you're not going to be able to fulfill your plan. But there is a third possibility of, I wouldn't say in the middle, but pro pro probably of triangulation of convergence in which you structure something that is significant in long term, perhaps in the complexity, but you leave space for things that can happen only once or they can surprise you. Mm -hmm. So you can, as I said, define the general color or the general direction or the limits of what you're looking for. And then I think you, you, you have promising possibilities in which the music can breathe um, in the sense of giving space to the performer, 
in the sense of having unique things that you never heard before and you know that you may never listen again. As you have an improvisation, this special aura of it's only happening now. But you also can have, you know, long-term planning. You can have complexity. You can have the possibility of repeating it if you understand that repetition is a repetition of difference and not an attempt at sameness. So I think there's much to be gained there. And this, of course, requires a different performance practice, a different approach from, from the performers to be able to understand, yes, the years and years I spent training and, and getting better and becoming not only a better, you know, presser of keys or maker mm -hmm. of sounds, but a better musician. Executor. Yeah. Yeah. They actually can be worth it, even if something happens differently, even if something even I didn't predict happens, even if I'm doing something that I can't control. It's a kind of an ethical thing, you know? It's like, I will expose myself and I will risk somebody in the audience saying, well, you know, he or she can't really control what she's doing. And to be able to say, yes, but that doesn't, doesn't mean I'm, I'm being an amateur or that doesn't mean I'm doing whatever. That just means I'm embracing a fundamental openness, which in the end is inherent to, to humanity. Do you actually tackle the limits of the instruments you are working with, you're composing for, to see how how far these limits could be pushed mm -hmm. and to actually watch the derived results to see what comes out when technically, for example, uh, someone, let's say, clarinetist or, or somebody tells you, my instrument cannot do what you wrote. Do you actually mm -hmm. write it deliberately on purpose to, to see how this uniqueness, the imperfection that is just um, unique to a certain given moment will yeah. come out. Yes, I do this. Um, there are two things that I try not to do, which are related to this. One is to write things that I know that absolutely do not work just to kind of create a, create a picture of failure. Mm -hmm so to speak. So I'm not interested in this fake failure in the mm -hmm. sense of, okay, yeah, which is a very controlled thing as well. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't think there is a special, there, there may be a, a special aesthetic experience of perceiving failure, but I don't want to stage it. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to trick the performer and, and expose you know him or her and like so this can't really work that's very noble <laughs> I, I think it's it has to be honest because you know yeah. i want to work with these people again so. <laughs> and another thing that i'm not doing is to push the boundaries in a traditionally virtuosistic way mm -hmm. that that means to say okay let's see if we can play even faster mm -hmm. which can which will also of course will will not but it has frequently been a manner of control to say to say See how fast I can play. Mm -hmm. But there are things to be gained on, on the border. I think one is, is embracing risk. So for instance, I just finished composing uh, one version of a solo cello piece, which was premiered in Darmstadt. And um, I'm still working on it, so it might evolve. Mm -hmm. um, Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so in this one, I'm exploring the higher harmonics. Yes played local so out of the bridge. So I'm talking of, of going above, let's say, the 10th harmonic. So go to, you know, 11th. I go up into the 16th harmonic. The thing is, many of these harmonics are very, very, very... Uh, I mean, if you go very carefully with your nail, you okay, now, now I found it. Then it broke. Mm -hmm. suddenly. So that's one reason why we don't use this a lot in written music, but mm -hmm. improvisers use it. And, but the thing is, then when I write, okay, play this note, but like nine out of tens, it will break or fail. Two things are happening. One, I am opening up a world of possibilities for me. So I can say, okay, I can use this, which before that it was close to me because it required control. But the second thing is, okay, how can I use this? So how do I, do I compose with this risk? How will, even if it fails, you know, mm -hmm. nine out of 10 times, how will it make, still make sense? So in, in this piece, uh, I mean, I won't, I won't give too many details, but like the piece progresses from the low strings to the high strings. So the low strings, the harmonics sound very kind of muffled because there's a lot of 
of inertia to the string. So you can hear them, but they don't really sing out. And in the high strings, they're clearer. So this is in the long term. But in the short term, I'm always going up. So each phrase, each harmonic phrase actually starts more stable and then it breaks and breaks and breaks and breaks. And then again and again, and each gesture goes down. So things are like mm -hmm. going in many directions, but you have stability and breaking, stability and breaking. Mm -hmm. And also there is like harmonic content in the sense of, I know what may happen. So there are some points where I ask for it to go slightly slower. So you, it's very risky and you control it for a little bit. Even if you don't control it completely, there is a high probability that a special thing appears, mm -hmm. which is predicted by the technique and the notation. So there's a lot of space for mistakes, for risks. It's highly virtuosistic, um, but it's not in a controlling way. So I'm exploring the, the risk of the border rather than pushing mm -hmm. the border. It's embracing the multiple possibilities in a non-improvisatory context. Exactly, exactly. Great. Wow, this is, this is really brilliant and inspiring. Thank you. So my next question is about the, this trend of perfection, the, the very uh, tendency, whether you are opposing it in your art, in your music, and what do you think about the modern trends in the contemporary art? I, I, this, this idea of, of trends is a very problematic idea in, in two senses. Uh, one is historical. So, of course, if you, if you look to the history of music of the last centuries, you, you see a shift from shared, socially shared um, techniques and aesthetical values. And then you, after that, you have like opposing schools. If you look at the first half of the 20th century, like Schoenberg and folks, like, oh, you do the like music and then Stravinsky doing neoclassical. So you belong to that. Mm -hmm. And of course, after, after a breaking point in the, in the post-war, you start to, okay, each composer has his, his or her own mm -hmm. thing. And then to a certain point where, you know, each piece has to has its own thing with a few exceptions. So there is a dilution um, in a historical sense of the clarity of, of being able to say, okay, now music is doing this or new music is doing that, or you have A, B, and C, and they are fighting each other. Um, so in a historical sense, this is the, uh, uh, there is this dilution. But that's not completely true an actual fact because you have structures put in place that help to create practical trends more than aesthetical trends. So of course there is a, in Europe and, 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 and the USA uh, mostly, but I don't know a lot about the USA system, so I'll talk more about the European one. Mm -hmm. um, you have, you have a, a structure, which is of course fantastic, of schools and professors, and then you have festivals, and then you have prizes. And so, in the end, this risks and many times does um, creating a machine that works. So you study with Professor X that uses this kind of notation. You copy his or her notation. Um, and then a, a, a committee that, that likes this looks at the notation, says, okay, this is, this is hot notation. And I'm going to pick this. And then this get, that gets premiered and that gets a prize. And then you get a perhaps a commission. Then you write. So th in this sense, there is style. There is a style of new music, or at least there are like a few styles of new music mm -hmm. um, going on in the world and and mostly in, in Europe. And these you can identify in talk of trends. But I have always felt that the strength of of new art is exactly the fact that we don't know beforehand what it means. <laughs> In this sense, uh, uh, the, the trends and the genres are, are very much belonging to, to mass media, where it is important, and of course, Adorno already discussed this in the, in the 50s, and where it is important that you will create a new project, with, which is a new iteration of the same, because the mode of consumption of that is, is not really to have the, the artistic object disrupt a system but rather to keep the system going on. So in, in, in mass media, there is no desire that the art will disrupt the system because the system is supposed to, to keep going on. And, and, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think that's a mood of existence. So I also like to be entertained. And in this sense, this sphere works well with my psychology in, in certain senses. But I think it, it, is a, it has been historically one of the special roles of art 
to be able to suddenly, you know, stop the world in its tracks and say, what was that? You know, to, to be there, for there to be no system in place to receive what has just happened. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, it's, it's very risky and, and it's, it's, actually, it's actually a bad idea to think about what is trendy, you know, because you'll end up trying to replicate a system and, and missing the effort to go after what is unique. I'm not claiming that I managed to do that. And I'm not claiming that I'm not the one to be a purist in the sense that, okay, everything is always new because of course, in another, in another point of view, nothing is new and everything uses history and, re and relates to tradition. So I think there are a lot of, of layers there of repetition. And, and then of course, then you can see uh, trends of, of technique, for instance, so one, one person develops a notation, then other persons learn it, or there are now hundreds of, of types of white noise on strings after Lachenmann. So, um, in this sense, there is a repertoire that was growing, but the, the desire that drives the creation for me should always be to have the, the scent of freshly baked bread, you know, to, to <laughs> say, well, this is not stale. Even yeah. if this uses the same ingredients, this is somehow created right now and stops me in my tracks and, it, and, it, and it's alive. And I, in, in a way that a repetition can never be. So while I think it's important to reflect briefly on, okay, what, what, it, what is happening? And in that sense, uh, I, I already mentioned that I think imperfection is, is, is being granted a greater space than it was some years ago. Um, I think there is a negative thread in the sense that there, there is a, people are fed up with, with too much control and, and, and too much fiction of complexity, not with real complexity, in the sense of, of being able to do very well all, all the times, you know? Not that that is not nice, but there is a sense of repetition when you hear, the first time it blew your mind, the second time it was interesting. At, at a certain point, you're just, okay, this is the iteration of this. And then I think it's important to open up to the unknown in, in, in a specific sense. And of course, there is the, I think the power that the very openness of imperfection kind of contrib contributes to that desire towards openness. Because as I, I have no pretension of thinking that there is one fixed perfection and it's always changing, there, um, and as a consequence, there are always new imperfections to be explored. And I think that spirit is a spirit that is beneficial to the creation of art. So what are your current projects, your upcoming um, premieres, perhaps, and interim goals for your big project, your doctoral dissertation? Where are you at right now? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, my big project now is to write the dissertation. Um, as people who have been watching your channel know, artistic research is, can be really tricky in the sense that it's very open. Mm -hmm. And you don't always know where you are because you're creating your own path. And I'm at a point where I have done, I, I won't say a lot, but I have significant um, documentary working sessions. Mm -hmm. So one option would be to just, you know, stop and write. Mm -hmm. But somehow the composer does not want that to happen. So I'm still doing some projects and hoping there is time to process them. Um, so these projects, um, currently I'm trying to finish the part of my solo cycle that will come into the doctoral thesis. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my main composition projects um, for, in my doctoral research has been a series of solo cycles. So in which I explore for, for each instrument that I work with aspects of those instruments that are in one way or another imperfect. So again, things that are hard to control, things that cannot be repeated, that go against the standard technique mm -hmm. um, and other senses. I had one project that was with ensemble um, in which I also approached it from a conductor's point of view, which was with the Platypus ensemble from Vienna. Mm -hmm. And in this one, I could investigate like togetherness. That's a thing that you can only do with ensemble and other aspects. Mm -hmm. um, but the main investigation is in solo pieces. So I have composed and premiered a, a solo cycle for oboe, for harp and for flute. And I am currently working on the solo cycle for cello and for soprano. 
Um, so these are the ones that I have to finish. The cello one already has a short version. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, that was the, premiered. The but I still there are still things I want to investigate in the instrument that I haven't done. And as I normally compose a cycle of etudes and normally something else, mm -hmm. so something non-etude, but mostly there are separated etudes on specific elements, not only technical elements, but ways of understanding imperfection. Mm -hmm. um, then it, it can expand, let's say, if I, in, in the end I don't have all the etudes and I have less, it, it's okay. So I, I'm still expanding on this. Um, then I have projects that I will probably not be able to finish in time for the doctoral um, dissertation, but which are somehow related. So I have a percussion cycle, which I started, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to finish in time, but which looks at Brazilian instruments mm. because Wonderful. they frequently have, like many of the Brazilian instruments have in themselves a very imperfect aspect. So for instance, like a kashishi, which is a kind of shaker. Mm -hmm. um, as it's not like a clap when you have a puck, one point you have whoosh, always. Right. So, of course, most of the techniques tend to compress that, uh -huh. but the sound in itself is multiple. Right. So that's an element that is, I would say, intrinsically imperfect and a specific understanding of precision or perfection, which is interesting. So, yeah, I was looking at uh, the kashishi as the kanza, which is another kind of shaker, um, the kuika, which is like friction drum. Uh -huh. um, what else? A shakere, which is a, a, a big wooden ball with, with a net outside, and the pandero, which is the Brazilian pandero, which is one of the most iconic instruments, beautiful instrument. But it has been such a long time to really understand not only the ways the instrument works, but the ways it misbehaves, mm -hmm. that, that, that will probably take me a little bit longer. And then, of course, I have, I have some things for, for the next years where, where I'm telling people I have to finish my doctor's <laughs> dissertation. But then I'll look at it. I, I have a commission from the Trio Tempestoso, which is actually here from Graz. I think they're moving to Berlin now. And of young people, very, very energetic, which is super cool. And some projects in Brazil, I have a project of writing for um, Baroque, Renaissance, and classical violin. Wow. So there's this former student who went friend. into, yeah, he went into classical, uh, to, sorry, historical interpretation. Uh -huh. and, but now he's asking for contemporary music. So that will be um, probably the end of next year or something. Brilliant. Good luck with all, all these projects. And okay. Good luck finishing them all in time so we can include more material on, on um, this progress in the dissertation. Hopefully. Thank you. Do you have any piece of advice for the emerging artists, composers, perhaps some do's and don'ts, whether... You can suggest something for the people who are starting out in their career. I think I have some things to say. I am, I am perhaps a slightly romantic person in the historical sense of, of romantic. That's great. Like, Go for it. And so uh, this can result sometimes not so practical. <laughs> but I think there are some important things. One, I think um, artists or aspiring artists should be aware of the multiplicity of ways. So there is not only one way. It's it, Probably if you think there is only one path, you are already living a reduced understanding of what art is. So there are many paths and they don't lead to the same place. They have different costs. They have different benefits. So I, I would say it's important to be honest with yourself in an ongoing way, because also our understanding changes and our, our wishes changes. But I think it's important to, to, to be honest to yourself because it's very, it's, very, it's very likely that you end up frustrated because you do not align the costs of what you want with the results you want to get to. So I'll be a little bit more specific. Um, I'll, I'll self-criticize now. Um, I am a mess. And I normally want more things than are possible. But I'm frequently frustrated that I don't have the things which actually belong to a system of values which I do, want, do not want to belong to. So, for instance, I, I have few prizes and stuff. I have, I have some from when I was younger. And at a certain point, I was like, no, I, I don't want to keep doing this. Which does not mean that I did not apply for some prize on the way. So I had a, I had a lot of rejections. But somehow I have also been on committees. And I know that on a committee, I would probably not select my compositions. Because, because you know, in a committee, you have 
10 minutes for each piece. And there are pieces that reveal themselves quickly and pieces that don't reveal themselves mm -hmm. quickly. I was listening in one of the lectures yesterday here in the Impulse Festival that's mm -hmm. happened and in which the, the Klaus Lang composer here from, from the Kuk, he was showing a counterpoint from De La Rue, I think. So uh, a counterpoint, a canon written in one page with a very simple notation mm -hmm. and an enigma to be solved, which results in very complex music. So that's the kind of thing that you look at the score and it's very hard to know how it sounds. Mm -hmm. And or, or for instance, I very much like to um, work with the performance practice. So I, I like to work with my orchestra, for instance, where you can actually take the whole orchestra, youth orchestra, and do microtonal exercises, mm -hmm. which you of course cannot do with a professional orchestra. So that that relates to the writing. So you see what you see what I mean. Um, that the way in which I think about music and the way in which I write music are not re really aligned with the with the system of, of prizes and and I know that mm -hmm. and I recommend but I'm still frustrated in the in this sense because there are contradictory things so it's important to to make the self reflections or else I think it can be very frustrating um, if you are looking okay the first question what what does it mean to succeed as a composer that's not so easy to answer okay I I would say that at a minimum to have your pieces played I, I think that but even that is, is open because there is this image of the romantic composer that writes, you know, what, whatever he or she wants to express or wants to make happen and does not really bother if somebody performs. So even that is open. But then, I, okay, of course, what if for me, what being a composer means is getting commissions, um, being, being, being played frequently by, you know, top tier groups, mm -hmm. um, I would say you have to enter the system as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm saying that as Brazilian because the system does not exist in Brazil. Mm. So, of course, you have fantastic musicians and fantastic composers in Brazil, but it just takes longer because this, right. you, you, you can't find a score. You know, I, I once spent half a year trying to find Beethoven Badenheit. In the, there was not no in the way. country. Yes, a friend oh. brought it from Vienna. Now you can find it. That was like <laughs> six years ago. But you couldn't find it in the whole country. A friend brought it from Vienna. So it's not like a contemporary score. No. It's it's really the yeah, Beethoven like score. The, the, the nine symphonies in Baden. I, oh I can find God. it. So there's a cost to that. In yeah. That sense. So if you're aiming for like this really professional in the sense of okay, I want to I want to ride the system, which is I think perfectly fine because the system gives you a lot of possibilities. Mm -hmm. It gives you certain power in the sense of power to make things happen, which I think is a positive power. You have to try to enter the system as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So for my Brazilian students, I say okay, uh, run. And try, you know, if, you, if you're not in the level for this, work two years and try to enter the system in a lower level, but then you're already there. Mm -hmm. Rather than, as, as I did, stay long and mature where you are from. And then, but this has other benefits. So in the way I did, I spent a lot of time in Brazil and I only left for my doctoral studies. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I feel I have a sense of connection to, to, to the performers of working with you with orchestra of relevance with the community that I think are, are very strong for me. And I have like a sense of freedom of pursuit that probably if I had entered the system earlier, I wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the, the, the famous Cage um, sentence that he was asked how he could compose so, so far away from the centers of creation. Uh -huh. well, of course, the US in, in the middle of the 20th century. And his answer was, how can you compose so close to it? <laughs> There are, there are different forces you have to contend with. So my, my advice would be this. Um, be, be honest to yourself mm -hmm. in a continuous assessment of what it costs and where you will get and try to align your strategies with this. Mm -hmm. And then remember not to be frustrated of not taking the, the other path because yes. it's another path. Oh, that's, that's such a temptation to always think, what if I would have gone to yeah. some other, right? So I'm sure that a lot of people think this way so yeah don't be disappointed with yourself if you're honest things are gonna go the the perfect way for you i don't want to say this word perfect the right way also it's not as long as you're yeah. ironic about it it's yeah fine. the optimal way okay martin permitted so the optimal way i guess yeah, yeah for for everybody Thank you so much martin for being here today with me on my channel thank you to everybody who watched this video to the end, I hope this was thought-provoking, inspiring. 
Uh, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, uh, like this video, and I'll see you in the next videos. Stay well. Thank you. Thank nice you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. I'm not even looking at my questions, I'm just yep. asking you other questions. It's important to understand there are hier I can't say the word. <laughs> Hierarchical, I know, it's, it's a yeah. weird word. What did I write? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense, okay.